You're in for a treat today as innovator Chris Biffle of Whole Brain Teaching joins us to talk about classroom management strategies that work and also some incredibly helpful ways to keep your students engaged and motivated. Welcome back to the Teach for the Heart podcast, where we tackle teaching challenges from a biblical perspective. Why are we here? Because we don't believe that our spiritual walk and teaching profession should exist in two separate domains. Rather, the hope we have in Christ should change how we approach everything, not just at home, but at school as well. So join us as we explore both the spiritual and practical sides of key teaching challenges, integrating them together so we can succeed at teaching, glorify God, and make a lasting difference in our students' hearts and lives. This episode is brought to you in partnership with the Herzog Foundation. We also want to thank our summit sponsor, Right Now Media. Engage students, equip families, and resource teachers with Right Now Media, the world's largest video Bible study library for every family in your school. With a Right Now Media subscription, every person in your school community can access over 25,000 videos for classrooms, leadership, and teacher development, and for families, students, and staff to use at home. Right Now Media offers content for all grade levels, preschool through 12th grade, and for higher education with customizable libraries and training tools branded specifically for your school. Right Now Media is also a proud ministry partner with ACSI, ACTS, and ICAA, offering more than 125 on-demand courses for teacher professional development on topics like leadership, apologetics, books of the Bible, and more. Give everyone in your school community access to the Right Now Media Library of Resources. Visit rnow.me slash teach for the heart to learn more. That's rnow.me slash teach for the heart. Well, I am glad that you are here today. We have a very special episode where we are going to be replaying one of the amazing summit sessions from the summit we had here recently, and that is with Chris Biffle. He's going to be talking about his incredible strategies with whole brain teaching. So whether you're super familiar with whole brain teaching or you've never heard of it before, I think you're going to find this episode incredibly enlightening. So let's jump right into that conversation right now. Welcome back to the Rise Up Summit. I'm so excited to have Chris Biffle with us today. Uh, a lot of you probably already know him. He's the creator of Whole Brain Teaching, and we are so excited to be talking with you today. Chris, thank you so much for being here. I'm always delighted to share Whole Brain Teaching. Can you share, before we get into it, just a little bit of your background, um, as your teaching background, and what led you to come up with this concept? All right, this is a good story. So I taught philosophy, college philosophy, for 25 years, and I was locked in lecture discussion, because that's the way you do college. Uh, My favorite philosopher is Plato, so I've been giving my Plato lecture for twice a year, for 25 years. I'd given it 50 times. It was it was darn good in, in 1995. So, Linda, I, I do a magnificent Plato lecture. I mean, I'd given it 50 times, and it was all across the board, and it was super clear. And I was just riding high. And I said to a girl in the front row, a good, solid B student, I said, what did I just say? She said, I have no idea. So I said to myself, gee, willikers. I'm not going to get any better at the Plato lecture. 50 more years is not going to improve this. So I came to the big decision, as we always do in teaching, the big wrong decision. I'll give up lecture. I'm just going to do discussion. And philosophy is great for discussion. Does God exist? Do we have a soul? What's the purpose of life? How should we live? Those are the big, juicy questions. So I did discussion. I didn't lecture. I just discussed. I'm a son of the 60s. I believe in discussion in a free-form classroom. One day I had a great discussion. Everybody, quote-unquote, was participating. I left the room, and I counted up how many kids participated in a great discussion. Now I had 35 kids. I had seven participating in the great discussion. If you have seven people participating in discussion, it feels magnificent. That means 28 of them are out to lunch. So I couldn't do lecture. I couldn't do discussion. I thought the darkest thought that teachers can ever think, and you probably have thought it too, I thought, maybe I should become a lawyer. You know, 
That's a dark thought. So I started trying stuff I'd never seen before. Most of it failed. And I began using some games that were kind of working. And I was coaching girls' middle school basketball at the same time. And I used the techniques to coach basketball that I was using to teach ancient philosophy. Different population, different subject matter, different environment, and the same technique techniques work astoundingly in both those two places. That made no sense. So I got a couple of former students who are then now teachers, one Jay Vanderfin in kindergarten, the other Chris Rexton in fourth grade. And I said, look, it's working in basketball at college. They tried it out, and we had 80 meetings in 95. Uh, it blew up from there. We decided from the start we're not going to be a business. We don't do cold calls. We don't advertise. All our online materials are free. We're not going to be a business. We're a movement, and it's blown up. Whole Brain Teaching is used in 100 countries. We've got 200,000 podcast downloads, 9 or 10 million YouTube views. It's a big deal that it started with giving up lecture and discussion. I guess there's a moral to that story. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. That is so um, fascinating to just hear. And it makes sense just kind of built out of just this problem. It's not, <laughs> this isn't working. Students aren't engaged. And then, you know, trying things and, and coming across just a really... Uh, strategies that are really working well. So some people listening are very familiar with whole brain teaching already, but some aren't. So can you give kind of a brief synopsis of some of the, the high level things for those that aren't familiar? Uh, whole brain teaching is multi-sensory, but by multi-sensory, we mean all the senses at the same time. So if I give you a definition, let's say I ask you a question, What's an adjective? I want you to repeat that question over and over to your neighbor. Then I'll call you back and I will explain. An adjective changes or modifies a noun. So you've seen it, you hear it, you're doing it, and you repeat it to your neighbor. And in our game context, you're having a lot of fun. So whole brain teaching, appropriately enough, is engaging the whole brain. Now, Here's the selling point. Then to ask yourself what makes video games so compelling. Compelling. Kids will play video games and almost not even eat. They will play video games at every opportunity. What makes video games compelling is they are whole brain engaging. You're seeing some stuff. You're moving things. You're hearing that music. You're talking to yourself or someone else playing the game with you online, and your emotions are going up and down. And you're in a continuous search for uncertain reward. Well, there are board games about all different kinds of things. Could there be an instructional game that uses video game like environment to motivate kids? And the happy answer is after 30 years, yeah. And the game is called Super Improver, and we reward for improvement, and we turn the classroom into a living video game. That's it, man. Yes. So can you share a little bit about... um I know we want to talk about kind of the classroom management side, but I feel like it is important that teachers understand just some of these ideas. And I know a lot of teachers um, will use all of the whole brain teaching aspects and others will pull in pieces. Um, so before we get into the classroom management side, can you share about um, just like the micro lecture and turn and talk concept, which I know is a really commonly used strategy? Sure. Um, we start with our attention getter, I say class and the kids say yes. But if you say that four or five times, they will begin to zone out. The problem in game playing, the problem in life, the problem in instruction is habituation. Mm -hmm. Linda, you can have chocolate cake on your birthday and it tastes great. And then you have it next morning and it still tastes pretty good. 
But after three or four days of chocolate cake, you'd rather have a bowl of string beans. Your brain becomes habituated to repeated identical stimulus. Mm-hmm. So if we just said class yes or one, two, three eyes on me or God forbid, flip the lights on and off, which some teachers are doing, it works for a little while and then it wears out. So we have all different kind of variations on class yes, yo class, hey class, yabba do class. That is our attention getter. And then we engage the brain with mirror words, which I'll demonstrate right now, me and you. Here we go, Linda. Just repeat after me. Mirror words. Mirror words. An adjective. An adjective. Changes or modifies a noun. Changes or modifies a noun. One more time. One more time. An adjective. Adjective. Changes. Changes. Or modifies. Or modifies. A noun. Noun. And I would say mirrors off. You'd say mirrors off. And I'd say turn to your neighbor and repeat that over and over and over again. Not just once. Over and over again. While I walk around the room and check comprehension. I mean, think about it. How many times do we teach what an adjective is or that sentences should have capitals or that six plus seven is equal to 13? We teach that for 12 years. And I get kids in my college classrooms who never got it because it was teached with insufficient repetition and insufficient emotional engagement in a deeply habituating instructional system. That's what happens. Kids come in, they like the chocolate cake kind of on the first day and after a while, more and more and more chocolate cake, which is to say more and more junk from the treasure chest habituates them and makes them wish they were at home playing Mario Brothers. I'm getting on my soapbox, but that's all right. I'm excited right now. Go. Well, this is just a really like a little bit of a light bulb for me. Um, and I hope for those of you that are listening too that like that idea of just the habituation that, that you have to keep things fresh. You have to keep things different. I noticed when you did the mirror, you didn't even do it the same way twice. It was different both times. And I do think, you know, repetition work has fallen out of vogue because of the boringness of it, the repetition of it. But what you're saying is we need the repetition. But we just have to make it not boring. We have to make it in ways that are interesting, that are different. And then, of course, the whole brain method, you're using all different senses and it's, it's engaging your whole brain. Am I, am I tracking right here? <laughs> you're not doing too bad as a beginning whole brain student. <laughs> we need contradictory things. We need consistency. You've got to keep using the same techniques. And we need variety. Hmm. And so with mirror words, let's just demonstrate a few versions of mirror words here. Here we go. Mirror words. Mirror words. Mirror words. Mirror words. Mirror words. Mirror words. (laughs) That's it. So consistency, mirror words, variety, different ways to do it, and we're engaging the whole brain, and we're lifting the emotions, and we're creating, and we haven't really got into it yet, but we're creating this beginning video game atmosphere where you don't quite know what's coming next. Ask me about yeah. how we increase engagement. Come on now. How, how do you increase engagement? I'm going to tell you. Listen, Linda, in the current teaching system, which is a massive failure, go talk to teachers, In the current teaching system, we reward for ability. That's called grades. Linda, when you reward for ability, the kids with the most ability get the rewards. And children find out in kindergarten if they're in that top 10%. They're in a race they can't win if we're rewarding for ability because not everyone has maximum ability. And if rewarding for ability worked, we just have to give grades, which is what we're doing, and it doesn't work. But if we reward for improvement, if we reward for growth, 
that every kid can win. Mm -hmm. We have special ed kids beating gifted kids because beautifully enough, special ed kids can grow more than gifted kids. And then the parents of gifted kids come in and say, well, how come my daughter is not winning at this super improver game? And we say, and the parent says, she's reading three grade levels higher. And we say, your daughter is wonderful, but if she doesn't start growing next year, she'll only be reading two grade levels higher. Everybody's got to grow and everybody needs to be in competition, not with anybody else, but with themselves. And that's the essence of our video game. We have a game called Super Improver. Go to wholebrainteaching.com, look it up. In Super Improver, everybody starts as a turtle. And when we see five improvements, gosh, they're a panda. And some more improvements, they're a kangaroo. 240 improvements throughout the year to get to the top. There's no treasure chest in the world large enough to give away 240 improvements to 20 kids and have them care about it. Let me tell you this. We've got this system called PBIS. Have you ever heard of PBIS, Linda? Yes. Yes, you have, my friend. In PBIS, we're giving away tickets, gotcha tickets, when we see kids doing good things, and the tickets typically go to the student store or lottery. We have schools where there's PBIS and whole brain teaching, and the kids trade the PBIS tickets for stars hit super improver. And what do they get? They don't get squat, except they level up. Picture this. Wild Jack is at home playing a video game. His mom doesn't stand at his shoulder and say, come on now, Jack. If you play harder and if you level up, I'll give you a handful of jelly beans. No motivation is needed to play video games hard. And in video games, we see grit that we never see in any other place in life. Edison is is revered because he tried 1,000 different filaments in an electric light to see what material would carry that fiery charge. Turned out it was carbonized bamboo, of all things. So Edison, oh, my goodness, he kept trying for a thousand times. Our kids outdo Edison. Our kids are trying and trying and trying and trying because of the magical structure of video games. And I never talked this long, so I'm really enjoying this. No, this is great. And we'll link to the Super Improver um, underneath this video so you guys can easily find that. And I love that because, I mean, what you said, you know, differentiation is another buzzword of the day. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. But really, the goal is you want your top students to learn and grow. You don't want them to stagnate. And you want the kids who are struggling to learn and grow. And you want the kids, you want everyone to just just learn, right? And so that, I love that puts everyone on a much more even playing field. The goal is just to grow, to learn, and yeah. in, a, in a really fun way. That is fantastic. This episode is brought to you in partnership with the Herzog Foundation. The Stanley M. Herzog Charitable Foundation's mission is to catalyze and accelerate the development of quality, Christ-centered K-12 education so that families and culture flourish. They provide online content, up-to-date news, trainings and events, grants, and hands-on organizational improvement initiatives for Christian schools and families. You can find all their initiatives and offerings at HerzogFoundation.com. Now, back to our program. So to this point, we've talked about a whole bunch of ideas already, and we haven't specifically necessarily talked about classroom management, but I hope those of you that are listening are recognizing this all goes hand in hand. If you have students that are motivated, that are like wanting to improve, that if you're engaging them, I mean, when I did that with you, I mean, I'm I'm locked in. I got to pay attention. I don't know what's going to happen next and I'm doing it and it's it's very engaging. So you're you're automatically eliminating a whole bunch of problems. (laughs) off the bat. But I know you also have a system that specifically kind of addresses the classroom management side with your whole brain teaching rules. So can we talk a little bit about that? Love to. So when we first sat down in 95, and I talked to these two elementary teachers, and I said, well, what can we fix in your classrooms? And they said, right off the bat, transitions. Transitions from A task to B task is where problems happen. 
teachers over and over again tell me they've got a hard time after six months still getting kids to line up correctly, much less get their math books out and their papers and put their name at the top. So rule number one, Follow directions quickly. There's my gesture. Here we go, Linda. I'm going to teach you all the rules. Mirror words. Mirror words. Rule number one. Rule number one. Follow directions quickly. Follow directions quickly. Rule number two. Rule number two. Raise your hand. Raise your hands. Or permission to speak. Or permission to speak. Rule number three. Rule number three. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. For permission. For permission. To leave. To leave. Your seat. Your seat. Oh! Ah! You're excited to leave your seat. Rule number four. Rule number four. Make smart choices. Make smart choices. Rule number five. Rule number five. Make. Make. Our dear team. Our dear team. Stronger. Stronger. And then we recently added this last one. Diamond rule. Diamond rule. Keep your eyes on the target. Keep your eyes on the target. Now, Linda, we can teach those rules in the first day, the third, fourth, and fifth graders, just by doing mirror words and some other shenanigans. In kindergarten, we're going to teach one rule a day. But those rules cover every possible classroom behavior. The first three rules are very specific. we got to get kids to follow directions quickly. And when they improve, they can get a super improver star. We've got to get kids to raise their hand for permission to speak. And the problem there is kids don't have to raise their hand for permission to speak anywhere except the classroom. So it's a new behavior. And... We can't have them wandering around the classroom. So that solves three very, very specific problems. There are other issues in instruction instruction besides those. So make smart choices covers everything kids do in class, on the playground. In fact, taught philosophy for 40 years, and all philosophers would agree you got to make smart choices. They just disagree on what those choices are. And rule five, make our dear team stronger. Kids understand what makes a team stronger and what makes a team weaker. They do not understand what expectations are. They do not understand what being responsible is. They have a foggy understanding of what being courteous or kind or all the adult words. But they have been on teams and witnessed teams where kids are doing things that make the team stronger and kids are doing things that make the teams weaker. One of our problems in education is we use adult speak to teach kids. And then the diamond rule is just a real good one. I mean, if kids are looking in the right direction, their visual cortex is engaged, you're halfway home. So those rules cover a lot of stuff, and we rehearse them. We don't put them on the wall. We rehearse them four or five times a day, and then we have kids lead the rules. It's one of the foundations of whole brain teaching. Great. I have two questions. So first, the diamond rule. So is that, at first, I wasn't sure if that was literal or metaphorical. So it's literal. Like, look, actually look at what we're doing, basically. Now, the reason we call it the diamond rule and not rule six We're not keen on the number six, and you can just figure out why that might be. Diamond rule, because it's so valuable, and this is a nice, easy gesture to make, it's so valuable, so precious, that we keep our eyes on the target. Perfect. Okay. And so the rules are great. You're right. They cover pretty much everything very simply and very easy to explain. Um, But I know the question teacher is going to have, well, what do you do when students don't follow the rule? Do you have a system to handle that, or is it kind of up to the teacher? Wait wait a second, Linda. Are you telling me that we've got some kids who are not following the rules? Is is that what you're telling me? I think it might happen occasionally. (laughs) All right. Let's take the toughest rule of all. Rule number two, raise your hand for permission to speak. We did a survey on Facebook of tons of teachers, and we said, 
do a 15-minute lesson and count how many times kids blurt out. Kids are blurting out on average nationwide twice every minute. That means in a 15-minute lesson, you've got 30 blurters. So you're spending all your time redirecting and scolding. Teach, redirect, scold, rinse and repeat. Linda, if scolding and redirection worked, I would write a book called Scold Like a Pro. You know? <laughs> it doesn't work. Right. What does work? First of all, you've got to get the kids understanding the rules. Second of all, you've got to get them to buy into the super improver, which is not that hard at all, because they have already have the brain patterns that are linked to whole brain engagement. And then what happens is a kid blurts out, you say two, and every kid in class says, raise your hand for permission to speak. So instead of you being isolated as the scolder redirector, you're using scolding to reinforce and continue to teach. When you say two, and everyone says, raise your hand for permission to speak, they're with you. They're relearning a lesson that takes lots and lots of reps. And then you just start using super improvements. All right, listen, we're going to teach for five minutes. Look, here's the timer. If I see anyone improving and raising their hand for permission to speak, then they might get a dice roll. And Linda, you know what's better than a dice roll? A dice roll with a nice green dice. When you roll the dice in class, every eye is on you, and this duplicates the super sophisticated engine that generates uncertain reward in video games. What is it going to come down on? If it comes down on one, two, or three, you get a super improver star. If it doesn't, four or five, you say, we got grit, we don't quit, which is the most important lesson of all. And a six is a reroll. Listen to this. You pick up the dice, Linda. You think kids would be saying one, one, two, three. No. Kids chant six. They chant six, six, six. Why? Because they want to see the dice a rolling. Talk to a gambler. You say to a gambler, why do you gamble so much? It's not the money. It's the action. Six is the action. Six ignites the nucleus accumbens in the brain to secrete dopamine. Yeah. So that's how you address one of the main problems, and you keep addressing it. Uh, really good point for your listeners. Do not become a teacher if it bugs you to repeat. <laughs> Linda, teaching is repeating. That's what we're yeah. paid to do. If you're in the lunchroom and someone says, I don't know how many times I have to tell kids this stuff, don't sit near them. Teaching is repetition. And if you're a basketball coach or a tennis coach or a music coach or a band coach or an anything really good instructor, you're going to repeat and repeat and repeat. Give me another question. Come on. I'm rolling. Yeah, no, this is great. And I think you're, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And when teachers think about it, um, if you are very consistent and repeat every time a student's blurting, you do that same thing, it's not going to, it's not going to get fixed on the first, second or third, but eventually students are going to pick up. This is, this is what happens every single time. Yeah. Um, and that, that really does pay off. Okay. Other question. Um, you mentioned transitions and I think whole brain teaching, if I'm right, has a specific recommendation for how to handle transitions as well. Is that correct? Sure. Uh, the thing is, is that we, let's just take the transition of the classic one, lining up or taking your seats. In the book, whole brain teaching for challenging kids, second edition, in the book, we say, use the three P. When I say lines, everyone says lines, lines, lines as they line up. When I say seats, everyone says seats, seats, seats as they sit down. 
Do not teach how to line up when it's time to line up. You don't have time. So you've got problem with kids lining up? Practice, practice, practice lining up and sitting down. And if Wild Jack is improving, he gets a super improver starting a dice roll. If the whole class is improving, goodness gracious. Everybody gets a super improver star. What do I care? I got 240 to give away. Everybody gets a super improver star and a dice roll. Practice, rehearse, gamify instruction. That's how we handle transitions. Whatever the transition is, papers out, papers out, papers out, papers out, and boom, our hands are like this. Improvement, super improver star. Awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. I knew I I knew it was something like that. So I thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay, another question just I'm just kind of there I'm just sharing as they're coming here. Um obviously some of these things you've said you've used these strategies across grade levels, but there's certain things that seem more like, oh, this would be really fit for certain ages. Do you um what do teachers do that teach older grades, like high school? Um how much of this do they, do they do you find that they have trouble where kids almost feel like it's like how do you adapt it for um older kids? All right, cards flat on the table. Our experience has been when I say our mine and twenty or thirty or forty other presenters. The higher grade you teach, the less interested you are in educational innovation. And the more committed you are to plowing through the curriculum. Hmm. That's just the way things are. Do we have high school and middle school teachers who flourish in the system? Absolutely. Are they typical? Are they normal? Are they ordinary? Not so. But the thing is, is that this didn't start in kindergarten. It started in college. I'll tell you another story. So I tried everything that you can imagine in 25 years to motivate my kids to look, to even look like they were interested. I said, I'll give you extra credit. I even offered to pay them money. I said, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. I stood up on the desk one time and crowed like a rooster to teach the difference between empiricism and rationalism. I was out riding my bike one day, two years later, and a kid came up to me and he said, I used to be in your class, Mr. Bill. I said, do you remember the difference between empiricism and rationalism? He says, no, but I sure remember when you stood up on the desk and crowed like a rooster. <laughs> All right. The thing is, is that in middle school and high school, we've got to fish where the fish are. The fish are not in the grade pool. The fish are not in, I'll write you a glowing recommendation. The fish, in general, for most kids, are not in the GPA pool. And I realized that in class. My college students were in a pool I'd never even thought about. What did they want? They wanted less homework. That was the pool. So I walked in. This is the beginning of whole brain teaching. I walk in. I got a bunch of balls of paper. I say, when it looks like you're paying attention, and I mean sitting up and watching me wherever I go, it looks like you're paying attention, that's great. I'm going to throw a ball of paper in the right-hand corner. When it looks like you're nodding off or looking around, I had kids stare at the wall. The wall was more interesting than me. So if it looks like you're not paying attention and you frankly don't care, I'll throw a ball of paper in the left-hand corner. When class is over, I'm going to count up the balls of paper. If there's more right-hand balls, that's one page less homework for every extra right-hand ball. If there's more left-hand balls, that's one page extra homework. And as soon as I said that, Linda, <clears throat> I can see him to this day. Three boys in the class, in the back of the classroom who always sat slouching down. As soon as I threw the first ball of paper in the more homework pile, they sat up and they paid attention. Now, we went from balls of paper to a scoreboard and a lot of other stuff. Yes, the system works in middle school and high school, but it is as big a change for them as it is for pre-K to five. But pre-K to five teachers, we have just found, are more flexible, are more interested in innovation, and are more interested in gamification. My colleagues in college did not care about instruction. 
They cared about subject matter. I was kooky. I cared about teaching. That does make sense. Um, it's just maybe like less of a comfort level. It's a little way more. Maybe I think it's maybe more out of the comfort zone for a high school teacher than it is for an elementary teacher. But if I'm hearing you right, your encouragement is like, yeah, this isn't going to some of these strategies are not going to feel like they're going to feel weird. You're not going to have to really like pull them out. You're going to have to, you know, kind of sell it to your students a little bit. But um, the encouragement is to really, if it works, is it worth it? <laughs> That's yeah. the thing. You, no one is going to go home from teaching kindergarten or 12th grade and not be exhausted. It's super hard work. But you have a choice between being exhausted because you're pushing a rock up a hill and it keeps rolling down over you. Between being exhausted from exhortation and redirection and scolding, dog tired, or be exhausted from teaching kids in this, in a new method. And we desperately need a new method. So you're going to be yeah. tired. It's going to be hard. But the choice isn't between hard and easy. It's between this hard or that hard. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you can catch that vision um, for the worthwhileness of it, um, I think that's really, really exciting. Well, you've shared so much with us today. Um, we have a little, just a few more minutes left. Is there any, I, I know you have a, probably a million other things you'd love to share. Um, anything else that's on your heart um, or that you think would be uh, particularly helpful for teachers to hear right now? This is what's occurring to me in the last few weeks. Um, K2 teachers, we used to say kindergarten is a separate world. K2 teachers are a separate world. And they need a special version of whole brain teaching. So I'm going to write another book. I'm weary, but I'm going to write another book, whole brain teaching for kindergarten to sec second grade. And it would take me a year to write the whole book. So I'm going to write it in episodes. I'm going to try to get book one out by the end of the summer so that we have a way to, to really help the kids. Get this metaphor. Let's close with this. I'm very, very, very negative upon the state of education worldwide because I talk to teachers and principals all the time. So I see that the great ship of education has sunk. Teachers are in lifeboats. Around them, kids are drowning in the waves. We've got to pull them into the lifeboat and teach them how to row towards the golden horizon. We don't do that by complaining. We don't do that by yelling at them, hey, swim harder. Pay attention to me. We do it with love and concern in the same way we would save a life. We are saving lives and we're losing a generation of kids from COVID forward. Principals are telling me they're seeing kindergartners are coming in with a level of defiance they've never seen before. And it's not going to get better next year. It's not in the newspapers. It's lived in the nation's classrooms. So we've got to do things a different way. We've got to save these drowning kids. And whole brain teaching is one way to do that. Plus that, it's free. Go to the website. There's no pop-ups. We used to have no ads on YouTube, except YouTube puts the ads on automatically. So it's free. It's fun. And uh, I especially encourage teachers to join the Super Improver Facebook page. And that's where all the action is happening. We've got grade-level Facebook pages. But uh, I'm putting out new stuff sometimes a couple times a week. So it's a lot of fun. And we're helping lots of kids. Awesome. Well, that was that was my last question was where can people go? So the website, wholebrainteaching.com is the website, right? And we'll make sure we link to that. Um, any particular place they should go when they head over there or just kind of start looking around? Yeah, uh, go to uh, day one. We'll tell you how to start day one, minute one. Uh, and also go to Facebook, Super Improver. Uh, and we'll, it's a closed group. We will admit you to the group and you'll see all the latest stuff. 
right. Well, thank you, Chris, so much. We, we so appreciate you being here um, and uh, encourage everyone to check out the resources. And once again, incorporate all of it or try out at least some of it um, in your classroom and, and see how it goes. So, Chris, thank you so much. My pleasure. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with Chris Biffle. I hope you were able to join us also for our Rise Up Summit. If you missed the Rise Up Summit and say, man, this was really helpful. I want more of this. Um, the event is done, but we do have the All Access Pass still available, which has every single session recordings from all the summit sessions you can watch at your own pace, at your convenience, um, whenever you'd like. So you can grab the All Access Pass at riseupchristianeducators.com. And I definitely hope you'll pencil it in on your calendar to join us next year. Well, this episode is brought to you in partnership with the Herzog Foundation. All views and opinions are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Herzog Foundation. Thank you so much for being here. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. In the meantime, teacher, remember, God is at work in you and through you, and he's using you to make a difference. Keep your eyes on him and teach for the heart. 